was always part of my adult life. I remember him when I was looking at me one day and said, you're always around. I said, what? Well, yeah. I was your student and assistant. So he was very foundational to my adult life and the principles that even I would uphold or emulate. Also the creative impulse, the playful aspect of creativity that there's something there uh, that's exploratory, improvisational, but then becomes an ornament that uh, speaks to creativity. So for me, that's everything Prop has written stands like that. As I keep thinking of how it played in his mind and how he subsequently offloaded it into the ornaments that's the story or the script and so on. Most people will read everything Prof writes just on its own terms and so on. But for me, it opens the window into what kind of mind conjures up this kind of thinking and, and, and how it goes through different kinds of stuff. I was fascinated by that uh, and so on. So when I read The Man Died, it opened up windows into how he synthesized that experience, how he dealt with the emotions, and how he even externalized those emotions to become what he wrote. And the other thing which I also learned was that a prof's intense sense of premonition of foreseeing things. And if you remember, what he, he foresaw what will happen. That's why he did those before, those political sketches during the Western crisis. I think before the blackout, they're called. And then after the blowout was after the war and so on. So he, he, that was a writer with a sense of premonition but he felt that literature was not the space to uh, put that. Instead, it was in theater. You know, it was in street performances. This is where he launched this guerrilla theater uh, stuff. Prof, to his credit, was amused by the first draft, right? <laughs> he said, ah, well, I understand the need to be dramatic, but you know, let me tell you a few Toy Stories, some of which never happened. And that became an important um, hook to the story. The relationship with that woman who was a nurse. I think the attraction to an uh, act of defiance, which reflected his own. So you see that um, honoring that act of defiance by that woman who they just saw at the traffic jam and how she fought back the soldier, that became almost like um, a microcosm of him and the system. The, the, the act of refusal to allow tyrants get away and so on. So that story, when he told us the story, I remember Bode was like fixated by the story. He said, how far can we go with this story? Then he said, no, go as far as you want. And so this was how, then I said, are there salacious bits in the story? He said, of course there are salacious bits. She was the my frequent conjugal visit and, and stuff like that. So like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know. So, and I as you know, it was not in the original. And for him, he said, because of the sensibilities at that time, a lot of people were alive and the, the dredging of all of these was really not the focal point. He wrote that book not as a, a memoir of himself, but as a memoir of defiance to a system 
attack. So it was not about what really what Ishweka per se, it was about Nigeria and so on. So much later, we will see how he wrote more personal memoirs. But I think it will be wrong to see the man died as an exclusive memoir. It's more like a commentary to a particular impulse that he honors, the impulse not to allow tyranny and, to, and so on. So that story with the woman, the nurse, I think we renamed her and so on for dramaturgic reasons, I think gave us some hook to humanize him too because the story it's easy to turn him into like a Christ-like figure. He's a happy-go-lucky guy who wants to have fun but his fun is interrupted by this conscience and so on. So, so that's why when the war thing is writing you see this transition from why can't we just be successful and have fun with the Bolai gays, with the Femi Johnsons, and they throw their party, discuss politics, what else do you want? But he takes it to another level and then it's well, just right place and don't go into all these daring acts. What you see there is that act of defiance. We used it as um, a template for introducing his recognition of acts of defiance. It's more about the human impulse to refuse tyranny. And, and that's what it is. And that anybody who does has died, basically. And that woman's act was amazing uh, as, as a subtext to his own defiance and incarceration. So then the question is, how do you now bring that per keep that person almost like a, a muse because that's what she became for his survival it's like this person who an ordinary person on the street can be that defiant what somebody like him why shouldn't they Because when you look at the cast, you look at the storylines, you look at the styles of telling the story. Remember way back when we used to say, this is Kanye Wood, this is Igbo speaking, this is Yoruba speaking. We've come past that now to being amazing storytellers, regardless of the language in which the story is told. And I'm hoping that the audiences catch up because way back we were all kind of vilifying Hollywood as an all commerce game. Some people are technically inefficient, yada yada. But no, see, the industry, the film industry, the storytelling industry in Nigeria has come to a place of coherence and technical ability. We'll still have problems here and there, but there is a general coherence and technical ability that makes the stories accessible regardless of where people are in the world. I think for me, um, in fact, the quality of what's going on, in fact, challenges the quality of the spectators in Nigeria. I deny, it, it almost feels like the quality of the storytelling has out paste the audience which is a good place to be because it's leading the audience in thinking in a more cosmopolitan way that for me is an amazing thing to say go back to the source of the story to the context of the story and use that context of the story regardless of the skill sets to tell the story because the story has to have a setting and the people who are telling the story must know that setting intimately. Um, the easiest way if we're going for high commercial, high commercial success would be to bring people who are experts in the bells and whistles of making a shiny story uh, that ennobles and so on. But no, I think the, it's, it's a way of coming back to the roots of this is an amazing society that produced World Show Enka too. This is a store as a place where its primary audience is. And if we're telling this story, it's important to tell it with people who are more intimate with this place and its stories and its abilities, technical and otherwise, to tell those stories. So I think for me, I never doubted 
in a minute. But of course, as you know, I have an army of former students who are really big time um, filmmakers in Hollywood and elsewhere that I could just call on a, in a whim to make this film and shoot it even in Nigeria. But that, for me, there's no learning curve there. For me, I, I, every uh, creative project is like going back to the basics and building from there back upwards. That's why for me, it, it was a very educational experience to come here. And I, I just knew that I would come across people, like-minded artists, you know, and people who I'm comfortable experimenting and failing and revisiting with. For me, that's more important than people who you're terrified of making mistakes with and so on. And, and I think, as you remember, that was my marker of anyone we were working with. I don't want somebody to come to say, this is the way we've always written the story. I said, no, that's not. And I think this was what enamored me with Bode. He was very attentive. He would go back, come back. And we had that back and forth dialogic way of working same thing with Agbo. I remember telling Agbo, I'm looking for three things. The length of the shot, the height of the shot, and the angles. Those are my obsessions in the visual language. So every time we are shooting a scene, I just would say, well, let's play with the length of the shot. Let's play with the height. And let's play with the various angles. Because when we're crafting the story together, we want this kind of visual rhythm to be part of the fabric of telling the story. And he just got it like in a heartbeat and even ran away with it, basically. I, I was say, wait, how did you do that? And he would tell me, oh, I had to do this and that. So I was learning with him. And I guess for people like me, who's lived mostly in university settings, learning is a perpetual process. And Nigeria was the best place for me to learn how to tell this story. It's a Nigerian story, but it's a global story. And it was best for me to tell the story from here. And my experience has been amazing. I mean, that summer of shooting here was so energizing for me. Um, I, it opened up so many opportunities in revisiting a space that formed me as well. Because this is where I started my career. And, and I never really left. I just will go and come back. And it was really a moment in time of coming back full circle to a space that I also came from and to learn from the younger generation of storytellers. It's an impressive cast. It was easy to direct them. Usually we'll start the day just telling everybody what our purpose was, giving people, everyone an opportunity to go rehearse themselves and so on. And, and then coming back to try it out. If it didn't work, we'll go back to drawing, drawing board. But it gave people the room to take ownership of what they are contributing to the fabric, especially all the lead characters. They were very committed to the story and they brought something that even I was not expecting. I thought Wale was just extraordinary. He's waiting for just to be called to set. Uh, and, and so each of them came with that extra thing they, that I was just simply a conductor, really. I didn't need to do too much in bringing the essence of the story out of either the big long characters or even the crowd scenes. I was so impressed by the extras that I was like, this is what we're looking for. This is what we're thinking. In fact, I didn't even have a song in mind. I told one of the actors the night before, they said, you're playing this role. I need you to come up with something that will excite the prison, other prisoners in a kind of a riot. So that was totally not in the script. It was just based on my faith in the abilities of these actors to bring something out. And, that, and it came from the most unlikely space, like Billy, who was playing Agunoris. So I was hanging with him, the players, and I said, I just, your character, is not, I'm not feeling that character. That character has to mean something to the other prisoners. 
That character has to be able to turn on other prisoners and so on. I'm not feeling it. And the next day, I said, he said, hey, listen, this is what I've been thinking. We'll discuss it. So let's go try it. And we did. And oh my God, it was like magic. That's how we did. We got that moment. Even Norbert, who came into the space, was surprised that, you know, I think he had imagined that when he came into that prison cell space, he would be the subject of that space. But the prisoners were the subject of that space. And that was exactly that kind of creative process where you're learning. So this is my way of saying there are so many moments that I found so amazing. I went back home, not exhausted, but re-energized in that I thought as a director, my role was to set up the, pick the story and to allow the actors kind of paint their own different contributions into that frame. There's a misalignment. I, I can explain why, say, as a historian of Nigeria's educational system, I can explain why. But one of the things you see is that most of the sense of agitation that we experienced with the young, especially with NSAD, those were the kinds of... Tonka was a barometer for that. He was like the person that those are his kind of stuff why was he absent as a reference is a critical question of the quality of thinking of those younger people or if you like the challenges of the educational platform that formed the generation of um, uh, of dissident use because Wojcinka is a, a, an ep epitomizes dissidence from a long time ago at the beginning of this nation called Nigeria and is consistently dissident to forms of tyranny so then we, you keep saying but why are they not seeing him as an inspiration some do some at different times will pick their selective in which part they can borrow to uh, expand on their thing. But as we say in Nigeria, Nigeria happens to rebellion too, you know? And this is consistent if you look at the backdrop that we're using for the Nigerian war, civil war, to the coups, the encounter coups, and even our current political dispensation. The Nigeria that happened is, um, varieties of ethnocentrism so even the young even when you guys in his 90s like what you say in the night in the winter of his life right that even at that stage the the story is still the same where the ethnocentric frame corrupts the purity of dissidents yeah so so and and that's why you find some people say well I, in fact it became so ethnicized that People from a particular part of the nation will just lump Polishenka to an ethnic group, whereas this is a guy who always consistently transcended ethnocentrism, right? So they wouldn't see it because they are obscured by the fact that the culture still remains a deeply ethnocentric culture. And the thing with ethnocentrism is that it always looks for the person who does not belong. It defines itself, in fact, against the person who is not it right it's the same thing with nationalism right that when you create a nationalism it starts in a very deeply emotional way a co collective sense of belonging then it begins to separate who belongs more than the other the emotional aspect of ethnocentrism always obscures the purity of a rebellious purpose and so on and I think what you got was that why would Choyka who was a, a Yoruba man be interested in the Biafran war why you know so, so those kind of questions that because for the simple minded person they'll say it's not his business 
But even Ojuku realizes the principle that Chuinka was following that scripted his desire to create a dialogue and avoid the war. So it's a long-winded answer to the question about the difference in context, right, between when he was younger to now. And I think the context never changed because despite the, the, the only thing from my perspective that changed is the volume of the resistance from especially by young people to the system but because we've messed up um, our reception of knowledge our, in other words our education we've messed it up Nigeria happens to our education system so much that our education system became ethnocentric we can't see beyond that ethnocentric constraint so that when we are in a situation of collective rebellion the ethnocentric frame paralyzes us and this is where you see and and so you and the beauty of this moment is showing us consistency versus the consistency of ethnocentrism you, you see the drama that it's creating where up till his 90s is telling you the ethnocentric way of thinking is potentially violent and oppressive and obscures clarity of purpose so you you begin to see that it's a it's a commentary the question opens a commentary on our country that you see a person who is very consistent in being critical of the environment and in defying ethnocentrism. And then you see a country that's consistently ethnocentric. Even as it gets more sophisticated, its ethnocentrism continues. That sets Juinka at odds till the end, right? It, it, because now it's no longer the older generation of the corrupt people, but even the quality of rebellion, you know, is at odds with this person whose clarity is not obscured over years and so on. When Choinka in 1952 collaborated with six others to create what was then called the Pirates uh, Community, that was a group of seven young men in universities who made one of their cardinal principles to be against ethnocentrism like that was like the uniting factor for them that they must know they mu their education must make them transcend the emotions of ethnocentrism that's 1952 and over arguably you could say in and out from that time up till today close to two million people must have been involved in this organization one way or the other right of course because nigeria happened it also happened to an organization like that so that it was split up it created its own little dramas and so on like the rest of the country so i think looking back if you look at societies where there is a qualitative shift in the population over time the value of older people who have been rebellious and consistently so would be much higher than it is in Nigeria today. We have to think extraordinarily how to be transformative. And I think this is an example of a person who has been consistently transformative. Well, Shrinker will be 90, he still loves teaching undergrads. And what's the difference between the students he's teaching at my university and the students he taught here? What's the difference? Those kids come from over 140 countries. That's 140 educational systems. You are in that classroom with them, well, you experience them when you talk. So you're thinking, where is your reference point? Yeah, right. But what puts your what unites all of these differences is our humanism. We're all humans, even if we come from the North Pole, the South Pole, or the East or West. And how do we cultivate that humanism? And that's the, what excites him to teach the students he's teaching now. He's writing plays with them in a classroom. 
my wish was that he was able to do that in a Nigerian university to let those kids on. But the problem is that you go to Nigerian university, each of the kids stay is from the uh, from the locality. I went to Ife, I came from Kano to go to Ife. You know, now I'm sure people will tell me stay in Kano State. <laughs> The audience is now. The urgency of this moment means that we, our stories, must challenge the slippages that our current youth make, and they become like the people they are defying. We, this is so urgent, and that's why this story is a catalyst to say wake up resistance is old as the beginning of time but the quality of your resistance is to defy localism is to define ethnocentrism is to ask yourself how does the other half allow me to become right and and how do do i become part of their own reality and that for me is the message for our younger generation first of all my focus is in nigeria but it's also global it's an example globally because nigeria is not the only country facing this situation in the united in the united states we still face that as well so i want this to be an example that in the, into, in the catalog of stories we tell in nigeria we're telling a story that goes to the root force of humanism refusing suppression refusing tyranny and it unites all human beings because that's what all human beings should do uh, um, and we take away all the vestiges of dehumanization tribalism and others so that we can have a much more engaging world and so for me that's why i think this this is the right time the political moment has made this film even more poignant <laughs>